Okay, so welcome everyone to um, our colloquium of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics at the Ralph Bunch Institute at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, we're delighted uh, to welcome you today and we have an exceptional speaker, one of the uh, theorists at the forefront of thinking about socialism in intersection with democracy and with such core values as freedom. So uh, Nicholas Rosales is associate professor, I hope this is still right, correct me as I go along, at the Erasmus School of Philosophy of Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Um, he um, studied or something at Trinity, in, in Trinity Hall, Cambridge, where you received the Harcourt Prize in Economics. And then you moved over into political philosophy and got your doctorate at Oxford where you were supervised by G.A. Cohn. Um, Professor Vrusalis has taught moral and political philosophy at Cambridge and at Leiden University and at Leuven and has held fellowships in uh, at Leuven and at Princeton um, where he was a Lawrence Rockefeller visiting fellow and where I had the opportunity to meet up with him and hear about his more recent work. And he also uh, ha held a fellowship at Aris University. So his research uh, focuses on distributive ethics, democratic theory, and the history of political thought with emphasis on Kant, Hegel, and Marx. And we're absolutely delighted to hear him talk today for us on why freedom requires socialism, reclaiming independence for the left. Nick, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks very much, Carol, for a very generous introduction. Thank you all for, for joining. I, I much regret that we can't all be together on Fifth Avenue talking about these things, but maybe in the future we'll get another chance to do it. Uh, so what I wanna do today is talk about um, freedom and its relationship to socialism. And uh, I'll, I'll um, show some slides in a moment. I'm gonna use as a foil for doing that, I'm gonna use a recent paper by John Romer, um, which deals with a lot of the questions that have been animating me, but also a lot of political philosophy over the past 30, 40 years. Um, the title was published in 2000, the, the Romer paper was published, um, I think in 2017 in Philosophy and Public Affairs. And by the way, I think it's a really good paper for teaching purposes as well. My students really soak that stuff up because it uh, just summarizes, it gives an outsider's and economist's view of 50 years of political philosophy, criticizes some of its main issues, some of its main um, uh, and most influential thinkers, but also tries to extract some conclusions about how to think about the socialist tradition, the socialist, the core um, socialist complaint uh, against uh, exploitation and inequality, and also tries to uh, offer a vision of what institutional setup would be most conducive to emancipation. So I think it's an important and interesting paper. Um, I'm sharing uh, my, uh, my screen here. So the title of the Romer paper, which I'm gonna use as a foil is Socialism Revived. And it's Romer's attempt to revisit the ethical underpinnings of socialism. Uh, and Romer has had, I'd say, an immense influence both in economics and in philosophy over the past 20, 30 years. And also, you know, he's a very, um, very influential uh, figure. So it, I think what he says is worth taking seriously. And also the intellectual sophistication with which he says it is important and relevant to how we should think and approach these questions. Now, the central Romerian claim, as most of you will know, is that thinking well and thinking clearly about socialism requires us to think about um, exploitation and exploitation relations in terms of 
distributive justice. And Romer has been making this claim for a long time, and so have his uh, colleagues and comrades, notably Jerry Cohen and the uh, majority of the so-called analytical Marxists, uh, but not only Marxists, uh, uh, people like uh, Richard Arneson, for example, and other uh, liberal egalitarians have been thinking about the core values of the left in terms of distributive justice and related notions. So these ideas are worth taking seriously for a variety of reasons, because they're very influential, because they're methodologically, they're cogently argued and methodologically, uh, I think, uh, very well, uh, um, very well articulated, uh, and I think they also have an influence in the contemporary debate on socialism, inequality, and the core values of the left. So, for all these reasons, I think we should engage with these texts and try to figure out what um, what they're about and what we should make of them. Now, the core claim that I want to make here today and uh, I'm going to defend is that Romer's revisionism fails on a number of fronts. But perhaps the most important for our purposes today is that the core value of the left, or one of the core values of the left, the ones, the ones specifically connected to the notion of uh, exploitation, is not uh, uh, a notion of uh, distributive justice. Rather, what we should rethink and bring back to the core of the of the socialist tradition is an account of freedom as um, control over the purposiveness of others. I think that uh, you, this idea of unilateral control over uh, alien purposiveness is what animates a lot of our concerns about exploitation. I'll try to ex to explain how it might do that and how that notion of unilateral control over alien purposiveness might help make sense of a lot of the of a lot of the, the things Romer himself uh, uh, says about about exploitation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly take you through the main claims of Romer's paper uh, and try to you know sum them up uh, in a, as succinct a manner as I can. Uh, then I'm going to say a little bit about what motivates Romer's position, uh, which involves not just a reading of, uh, you know, 20, 30 years of political philosophy, but also uh, a reading and criticism of uh, Marx's theory of value and Marx's theory of exploitation. Um, and then I'm going to say what I think is wrong with, with this Romerian revisionism and how we might go about thinking differently about these core ideas and the core values uh, the left is or should be concerned with. So first, um, in, the, in the paper, I, I deal at some length with Romer's, uh, the two models that, the, the, the reproduction model that Romer um, develops and defends in that in, in his 2017 paper, um, and which features a contrast between two economies, an economy of collective ownership and an economy of capitalist ownership. And, you know, I, I don't think I should take you through the specifics of these models. It's not, there's no point doing that. Uh, I'll just summarize the main, the main issues here. So uh, in the Romer model, what's relevant for us today is that um, you can derive certain results about uh, equilibrium consumption of uh, labor and uh, resulting utilities, resulting um, degrees of welfare satisfaction, let's say, um, through a very simple, um, a very simple uh, division of labor in the Romer model. There are basically two technologies. There's a factory farm and a forest, and there are a thousand peasants who collectively own 500 units of seed corn. 
And in the, in the very simple collective ownership economy, Romer shows that there is a, an equilibrium which is egalitarian Pareto efficient, such that each of the peasants spends half a day working in the farm, and then she works one and a half days in the forest, um, netting uh, one and a half units of corn. Um, so these assumptions, by the way, I forgot to mention, these assumptions um, make sense, these rather uh, conclusions make sense on the assumption that you have these thousand peasants whose uh, objective function is uh, to maximize uh, leisure subject to um, sufficiency. So having um, su uh, subject to subsistence. So su subject to uh, consuming one unit of, uh, uh, of corn uh, per week in perpetuity. And Romer shows that in this equilibrium, which is the unique stable equilibrium, which is also Pareto efficient, uh, the peasants work for 2000 days in order to reproduce themselves. So they produce their own subsistence and they also reproduce the, uh, the stock of seed corn. Now already, if you, if you think about what's going on here already, you can see that some of the basic assumptions are going to be very important. Some of Romer's assumptions are going to be very important for deriving results about under um, under alternative uh, property arrangements, um, such as a capitalist economy, a very rudimentary, very simple, reproducible capitalist economy. Economy two. In this economy, by contrast to economy one, the one percent owns all the seed corn. So it's ten capitalists who own the 500 units of seed corn, and the remaining 900 peasants own nothing but their ability to work. So uh, there's going to be something like a labor market in which the 900 rent themselves out, rent out their ability to work to the 1% uh, in order to earn a living. And Romer shows that in this alternative arrangement, what you're going to get is a um, a labor market where the mar a labor market is going to clear at a wage that's equal to a third units of corn, um, such that um, each capitalist will hire about 167 peasants who are all going to work uh, for three days in the factory farm. Three days of work is going to earn them a unit of corn, and they're going to earn subsistence like that. And the remaining 823 peasants who can't work in the um, in the privately owned farm will need to work for three days each in the forest, uh, which will also earn them their subsistence. And in this unique equilibrium, the capitalists are going to appropriate a thousand units of corn, of which they're going to spend uh, one, about 166 as wages. And about 333 units of corn is gonna they're gonna pocket as profit. The uh, total labor time worked in this economy is gonna be equal to 2,970 days, which is 970 days greater than under economy one. And so Romer says he infers that, um, and he uh, attributes this view to to Marx. He says. Marx calls the extra 970 days of labor expended by peasants surplus labor, and its existence comprises exploitation. In other words, with private and unequal ownership of the capital stock, peasants must work 50% longer for the same consumption they receive with ownership of capital. So far, so good. Uh, the Nothing really controversial uh, at least normatively controversial has been said. All that has been shown is that we can derive certain interesting results about how long people will work. Uh, and as I'll argue in a second, who is gonna serve whom um, in, a, uh, in an equilibrium uh, situation under different ownership arrangements. Uh, in an equilibrium situation, uh, moreover, that's efficient and satisfies all uh, of the um, 
realistic or unrealistic assumptions of neoclassical economic theory. Now that's important. If you can prove that there's going to be something wrong in a general equilibrium economy, even under neoclassical assumptions, then you can probably show it for any economy. Um, and that's one of Romer's fundamental contributions to economics, I think, is taking neoclassical assumptions and showing that even under the most um, extreme assumptions about market clearing, absence of externalities, uh, the nature of agency, and so on, even under these assumptions, you can get um, unjust uh, results. That's that's a very important. It's it's impossible to to overstate how important this is methodologically. Okay, now what I want to talk about for the rest of this this session is the normative assumptions underpinning the rest of Romer's argument and his revisionist main revisionist claims. So here they are. Romer says. It must be admitted, contra Marx, that there are many instances of capital accumulation through hard work or inventiveness. And it is not obvious, at least from Marx's arguments, why the hiring of workers to labor on this honestly accumulated capital and their consequent exploitation should be considered as an instance of injustice. We have no argument from Marx that the existence of exploitation and profits is as such condemnable. And it is not worthy that Marx was sensitive to this problem, for he spent many pages of capital arguing that the accumulation of capital came about through robbery of one form or another, rather than honest hard work or ingenuity. So here's my attempt to summarize these claims. Romerian revisionism consists in, first, the claim that Exploitation, as defined by Marx, is objectionable if and only if it issues from distributive injustice, robbery of one's form or another. Second, that if exploitation is to count, if capitalism is to count as exploitative in objectionable sense, then it must come about through such injustice. And three, that Marx affirms too, which is explained by his being sensitive to one, for he wants to condemn capitalism as objection of the exploitative. I'm not going to talk about claim three. I, we can leave it for the q and I'm not going to talk about the exegesis of, of Marx uh, today, uh, although I think that um, Romer is wrong to ascribe uh, to, to claim two to, to Marx, but um, I'm not going to talk about it extensively. What is relevant here, and one thing to note immediately, is that um, claim two uh, effectively says that there is such a thing as uh, clean capitalist accumulation. So accumulation through uh, hard work or inventiveness, hard work or ingenuity. Um, and that if accumulation, capitalist accumulation arises through such hard work and ingenuity, then it is not as such objectionable. And this claim has muscle, uh, and I think it's also relevant to um, a lot of contemporary discussions about capitalism because it implies that capitalist institutions can arise um, unobjectionably without um, colonialism, without violence, without robbery of any form or other. And when they do, they're not objectionable as such. And uh, I'm not going to try to question the assumption that clean capitalist accumulation is possible. I agree with Romer that it's possible. And I think Marx also thinks that clean capitalist accumulation is possible. Um, but I will argue that it does not follow and it is false that what we get thereby is not objectionable as such. 
Um, but note that you know whoever affirms that possibility um, is must perforce side with uh, the Romer position. If you think that capitalism presupposes colonialism, for example, and you can't get capitalism without it, then if it's possible, at least it's conceptually coherent, that we're going to get capitalism without without uh, colonialism, then um, then capitalism is not as such objectionable. But we can come back to this um, in the Q&A. What I'm going to do for the rest of the session is trying to undermine claims one and two and offer an alternative explanation for the uh, wrong makers, the injustice, if you like, of the transition from economy one to economy two. So let's look at each claim in turn. Claim one. Claim one, uh, the idea that uh, exploitation is objectionable as such if and only if it arises from a from an injustice, from a from robbery of one form or another. And when Romer talks about robbery of one form or another, I think he has in mind something along these lines, that it is bad because unfair if someone is one worse off than another through no fault or choice of her own. So I think Romer is um, is a lack of egalitarian. He affirms this, this position. He has for a long time. And I think many, um, many, uh, uh, the analytical Marxists affirm that position. Uh, and I think it is a very widely held view, uh, uh, view about uh, what makes exploitation unjust. And I think Romer affirms too the claim that um, capitalism is uh, unjust just because and just when it arises from robbery of one form or another, because he affirms another principle, Nozick's principle, which says that if a distribution D2 arises from a just distribution D1 from just steps, then D2 is itself just. And by dis and I mean here by distribution, I mean something very narrow. I mean what Nozick means in anarchy state and utopia, which is any state of affairs whose that that's representable in the logical form uh, to everyone according to uh, their desserts, to everyone according to their needs, to everyone according to their uh, labor contribution or whatnot. And um, so the application of, of Nozick's principle can be seen in um, in Romer's claim that economy too can arise from just initial conditions, such as economy one, if we assume that it is just through just steps, steps conforming to the lack Galatarian principles. So here's what I'm going to do now is I'm going to offer two arguments to um, broad movements, let's say, argumentative movements against um, revisionism. The first is a negative argument, and I'm just going to try to offer some provisional counterexamples. And then I'm going to try to shift the burden of proof and talk a little bit about the, the alternative, which is a the positive argument, let's say, uh, for thinking about one of the fundamental complaints of the left, not in terms of distributive injustice, but rather in terms of unilateral control over, over the purposiveness of others. I'm going to try to explain how we might cash that notion out. So against one, um, again, the one being the idea that exploit exploitative injustice, exploitation, when unjust, uh, presupposes um, uh, rather, um, distributive injustice is both necessary and sufficient for uh, unjust exploitation. So in terms of the necessity condition, uh, I have uh, the following counterexample. So the counterexample trades on the idea that 
you can have a situation in which there's perfect um, background justice and yet people exploit one another. There's uh, two people in the desert. Uh, one, one, of the two, one of the two finds herself in a pit. The other one comes over and says, um, I'm going to get you out if and only if you sign a sweatshop contract with me or you work for me for the rest of your life for a dollar a day. And I think this offer is exploitative. But what's relevant, I think, in these pit-like situations is that uh, they can be cleanly generated. There are, you know, there, there are clean pits. There could be clean pits. Um, the thought being that um, background, the background situation here, um, the pit generating situation could be perfectly just and could have, could have started from perfectly just uh, initial conditions and could have been arrived at through perfectly just steps. So for example, um, the person who finds herself in the pit may have failed to buy costless uh, insurance against falling in pits. And if you're a lucky egalitarian, then you'll think that the resulting distribution is not unjust. She had the opportunity to purchase the insurance um, and she blew it. There's nothing unfair about the resulting distribution. So that's a provisional counterexample to the necessity condition. The provisional counterexample to the sufficiency condition, the idea that distributive injustice suffices for unjust exploitation, is an example that Romer himself uses, which is the rich and poor case. Um, the rich and poor case involves a rich person who has a prodigious uh, appetite for work and a poor person who wants to read poetry all day. The poor person works on her own land and then goes over and offers her services to the poor person uh, and receives a wage uh, for um, for working the poor person's land and um, um, uh, rather receives a proportion of the a proportion of the produce, um, the poor person receives a, a certain amount of the of the product, the net product, and the rich person receives the residual. If you think that distributive injustice suffices for unjust exploitation, then you must think that. There is exploitation in the rich and poor case, but Romer does not think there is exploitation in that case, and neither do I. Uh, so that's a provisional counterexample to the sufficiency condition. Okay, so these are arguments against the thought that um, distributive injustice has something uh, important to say, to speak to the sufficiency or the necessity of. Um, 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 is rather either sufficient or necessary for unjust exploitation. Now, um, against two, two you will recall is the idea that capitalism presupposes robbery. So capitalism is not possible without robbery, violence, um, colonialism, or whatever. Um, and I said that that thought is supported by Romer's uh, affirmation of Nozick's principle, the idea that if a distribution arises, if a just distribution um, arises, sorry, if a distribution arises from a just distribution through just steps, then that distribution is itself just, that original, that the uh, resulting distribution is itself just. Um, and uh, I recently discussed this with Romer, and he said that he does not affirm Nozick's principle. He does not affirm Nozick's principle because he has an account of distributive injustice subjected to uh, an account of solidarity. And he has recently published a book entitled How We Cooperate, which tries to provide the an alternative to the um, dominant uh, behavioral ethos of capitalism, namely Nash equilibrium, he thinks, Romer thinks that there's an alternative way to cooperate and that 
a distributive justice, a distributively just society would adopt that ethos and um, care that that ethos be um, embodied in its institutions. And that ethos, he says, um, does not countenance the, the Nozick principle. And uh, so I think um, it's fair to say that in light of that revision, uh, Romer does not affirm the, the Nozickian principle, although I'm a bit skeptical that the solidarity idea that's supposed to constrain all this distributive stuff um, can be systematically derived. And I don't think Romer himself makes an attempt to derive that idea systematically. And it appears as a completely ad hoc uh, notion attached to the distributive injustice theory just in order to limit the, um, the extent of inequalities which it allows. Okay, so I've said a little bit about principle one, um, and um, I'm not going to talk about principle two very much uh, because I do think we can we can leave that for the Q and A. I think the naked distributive view, Romer's naked distributive view, can't uh, deal with the kinds of objections that I have here. Um, one of them being, you know, unjust enclosure type case. Um, cases where everyone, you know, everyone around me uh, owns uh, bits of the world, uh, their ownership is just, uh, and through spontaneous um, and uncoerced uh, transactions between them, they end up owning all the land uh, around me such that I remain permanently uh, landlocked by Nozick's principle. Um, and, you know, I think these kinds of situations uh, may be uh, dealt with by, by the uh, account of solidarity that Romer proposes, but that's up for grabs. I mean, we, that's something, something for us to discuss. Now, I want to conclude by talking about the positive idea here, uh, the positive argument and the, um, the way I think we could make progress in thinking about the uh, fundamental complaint against exploitation, not as a form of distributive injustice, but rather, as I said in the beginning, as a force of unfreedom, as a form of unilateral control over alien purposiveness. So I take it that one central concern of Marxian socialism is unequal control over the labor of others. Um, and that's manifested not just in uh, unilateral flows of labor time, such as, for example, in the case of the uh, uh, capitalist ownership economy, economy two that I mentioned before, uh, but also in terms of the disposition to extract unilateral labor flow. And that's relevant and important to what I take to be the crucial constraint or one of the crucial complaints against capitalism. The underlying idea is that under mandatory social cooperation, so social cooperation that is about uh, um, promoting each other's conditions of independence, there is a presumption in favor of being able to bind others to as much and as good labor as they can bind you. So an alternative ground of exploitation complaints might be something like this, the non-servitude proviso. So for any able-bodied and able-minded agents or groups engaged in mandatory mutually affecting cooperation, and barring any special justification that exempts them, none should possess unilateral control over the labor of any other. So I think this proviso establishes at least the presumptive case against unilateral control over the labor of other. I think it, what I try to do within the paper is shift the burden of proof, shift the burden of proof against Romer. Uh, 
and shift it in such a way that it preserves the injustice of economy two, even if economy two um, is created or is arrived at from just steps, from a just initial situation, such as economy one. I want the uh, injustice of economy two not to be parasitic on the Nozick principle or something like it. And so then the question is how the how is the proviso justified and how can we make progress thinking about capitalist institutions and the critique capitalist institutions through it. In the paper I provide a number of distinctive justifications for the proviso. Uh, one of them might be Republican, so you might think, for example, that uh, unilateral control over the labor of others, whether vertically, so from boss to worker, top floor to shop floor, or horizontally uh, from the um, from the multinational to the local store, from the the dodgeball big gym to the to the dodgeball small gym and so on. Um, all of these forms of um, unilateral control uh, over over purposiveness um, might involve arbitrary power. So if you're a Republican, you think that uh, control over arbitrary, rather arbitrary power or arbitrary or um, uh, yeah, um, arbitrary power over over others uh, or arbitrary power of the over the purposiveness of others is objectionable. Um, add, adding to that idea the premise that um, work relations, whether of the vertical or the horizontal variety involves such arbitrary power, it gives you the desired conclusion. It gives you something like the non-servitude idea. But I'm more partial to a, uh, you know, the Republican school and the Republican tradition has been very, very influential in contemporary political philosophy. I'm more partial to a more Kantian, um, uh, more Kantian reading of the proviso. And the Kantian reading would hold something like this. It would hold that um, forms of vertical or horizontal uh, domination involve unilateral control over the purposiveness of others in such a way that um, uh, those others lack um, lack adequate um, discretion over the conditions of their of their production of their own um, purposiveness so the the kind of servitude involved here would have a kind of um, i'd say um, recursive structure so the thought is that in having your uh, purposiveness subjected to unilateral control by others, you do not, by dint of that fact, have your purposiveness subjected to offices that are constitutively geared towards promoting that very purposiveness. Sure, market relations uh, can promote uh, human purposiveness, so can market exchange, uh, and so can forms of vertical and horizontal subjection, but they do not do that constitutively. It is not built into the nature of the office that your purposiveness is going to be promoted as such. And so I think there's a Kantian story that can be said about the non-servitude proviso and uh, offer a justification for it. Um, and that would that justification, I take it, would be about would have to say like the Republican justification something about the promotion of uh, of individual purposiveness and the absence of unilateral control over it. Now, 
a last word about how how these things might fit together and how they might help us make progress uh, and think about socialist institutions. I think we have a very, very rich, um, you know, palette of, of thoughts and, um, and concepts for thinking about the institutions of socialism. We have a lot of interesting things being written and said, for example, about um, market socialism, uh, and uh, democratic planning at the intersection of democratic planning and uh, and uh, market socialism, how we can have markets without capitalists and so on. And Romer has Romer and many others have written very interesting and important things about these questions. And I think that if we were to shift the focus from thinking about distribution, to thinking about um, control over purposiveness, alien control over purposiveness, and what it means for people to serve one another versus what it means for people to be servants of one another, we can better understand these models and help extend them in uh, emancipatory ways. So just to give you an example, I think it's no coincidence that a lot of the stuff that gets written that begins from the Romerian distributive premise tends to be very, um, let's say, uh, bottom down. So, uh, sorry, uh, top bottom. So it's not a coincidence that, um, uh, for example, Romer's um, uh, model of market socialism is a form of managerial socialism. I think th that model is top it's top bottom in all kinds of ways one of which is that you know um, it just involves uh, managers having a lot of power over workers uh, again top floor to shop floor um, in a way that does not take considerations about servitude and unilateral control over purposiveness Seriously, I think that's a very big lacuna in these theories. And I think we can make a lot of progress just thinking uh, about these models that these economists have, have devised, um, not in terms of distribution, but rather in terms of freedom as uh, non-subjection to the will and purposiveness of another. But I'll stop here. Thanks for your patience. Thank you very much. Um, and um, I think now, uh, if you would use the raise hand function, we can move to um, uh, Okay, I see people are applauding. So here we go. I can applaud loud and the rest of you just sort of visually. Uh, so, but now I want to move to the uh, question and answer uh, session. And uh, if you use the raise hand function, it will make it easier for me. So we can start with Jesse with a question. Hi, yeah, thanks so much. The talk was really interesting. Um, yeah, really interesting sort of reformulation, pushback against Romer. Uh, I guess I, yeah, I ended up having a few questions, but I'll just pick one. Uh, to sort of focus on your positive argument and the non-servitude proviso, um, right? So you state the non-servitude proviso in terms of people having unilateral control over the labor of others. And I was just wondering if you could sort of give a little bit more of an account of the kind of unilateral control you had in mind and what that looks like. Um, because I wasn't fully clear to me, for example, how that sort of unilateral control is present, for example, in, you know, Romer's economy too, right? Because it seems like in that case, right? So you've got the capitalists, they control the farm and say, I'm like one of the, you know, the laborers, uh, right? And you say, well, look, it seems like these capitalists control my, you know, you, I feel like you want to say that they, capitalists have unilateral control over my labor. But I'm sort of, I'm at least tempted to say, well, you know, it's not clear to me that my labor is controlled because if I can go out and work in the forest, you know, I'm sort of faced with these two options. I can work with them for three days. I can work in the forest for three days. But in some sense, I'm like, well, I don't, you know, I don't really need them. Like I, I can exercise my labor however I want. I could work in the farm. I could work in the forest. I could produce my own seed corn and sort of, you know, become a capitalist myself, conceivably. Um, right. So I'm just curious, what in what sense 
what kind of control you see them as having over my labor, given that I seem to have an equally good exit option that doesn't require working for them? Uh, thanks. There's this issue of exit options. I think, um, I, you know, the can here, I mean, the, 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 the modal, um, the, the modal modifier is how, how it is spelled out is, is very important. And of course you can go to the forest, but working in the forest is, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, it will take you um, in the, it's much more arduous to work in the forest. So in the, um, in the original, um, in the um, collective ownership economy, you can only produce um, uh, your subsistence in the, in the forest by working there three days because there's no capital. Um, whereas you can produce your subsistence if, if there was enough seed corn, you would be able to uh, produce your subsistence in the, in the, um, in the factory in, uh, in one and a half days, as opposed to three. So, and, and reproduce the whole economy. So, so such that work in the, forest is more arduous than work in the in the factory but it's not um so important here what's important is as you said i suppose the 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 nature of the options and my claim my thought here is that the nature of options does not even if you have the best available um exit options um, that does not suffice to attenuate what uh, the um, uh, what a master, um, a dominating master, does to you, or to uh, remove the uh, stain of domination from their actions. Suppose that you know uh, there's a, an absolutist monarchy that provides. Um, that provides excellent exit options to its citizens. It even offers them free trips abroad. Um, it even offers to ship them abroad. I'll, I'll take you, I'll send you abroad first class. I think the absolutist monarchy remains objectionable as such, despite the existence of good exit options because it's an absolutist monarchy. And as long as people must suffer it or optimize by suffering it, despite the presence of um, good exit options, it still dominates. So my thought, so the thought here is that um, exit options uh, excellent exit options do not suffice to remove the, the tint of domination from a relationship. Can I ask a very quick follow-up? Yes. I mean, would you say that's true? I mean, even if the exit option is say superior to this, like, I mean, su suppose that I say, well, I am in some sense my own little monarch right now, right? I, anybody who wants to can come to my you know, apartment and I can yell at them and tell them what to do, um, right? And granted that's a little costly for them, but so in some sense, you're all living the exit option. I, would you still say that I'm sort of exercising unilateral control? I mean, especially with, say, when it comes to labor, right? Like anybody could come be my servant if they... Yeah, so. yeah. I, I, think, I think that's a flaw. I think it's plausible to think that um, even if, you know, uh, you know, Venus in Furs here, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, Mazok, I want to... <laughs> want to sell myself to you. I, I, I'll let you do anything you want to me. You still shouldn't do it. Um, and to do it would, uh, would involve dominating me. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it might be that the guy in the pit, for example, the, 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 uh, actually likes being treated that way. But the other guy still shouldn't offer uh, a sweatshop contract. Or, I mean, well, she could do it playfully. 
but that's the whole point. If there's, um, uh, if she does it playfully, then she's not really dominating the other guy. Maybe they're they're doing make believe, but that's not the case in the in the pit example, and it's not the case in the absolutist monarchy. The absolutist monarchy that offers excellent exit options and free trips to uh, to perfect democracies um, still dominates its subjects, I'd say. And I think it's similar with um, economy too. Um, it doesn't matter that the peasants have, the, the um, factory peasants have the exit option of working in the forest. Um, it's still important that they optimize through the unilateral control over their productive purposiveness by the capitalists. In that sense, I think they're exactly, these capitalists are exactly, um, are, are relevantly like the absolutist monarch with the excellent options. Okay, thank you. We have uh, some other questioners of uh, Patty next. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rusalis, for your talk. This is really interesting. Um, and I have a number of questions too, but I think I'll, I'll just ask one of them, um, which is about the non-servitude proviso, the way that you've laid it out. I think that I definitely agree with you in terms of spelling out exploitation, um, in terms of um, control and power and domination to use the Republican term, rather than through um, how the, um, how, rather than through distribution, as you put it. But I'm wondering about the way that you specifically have articulated this proviso as for any able-bodied and able-minded agents or groups engaged in mandatory mutually affecting cooperation. Um, I'm wondering about the condition for able-bodied and able-minded agents, um, because that would mean that abuse of disabled workers, of non-workers, of even, I mean, it depends how you define agent, but non-human animals is not constitutive of exploitation. And maybe the reason is that we want to reserve exploitation as such, um, for specifically economic kinds of abuse of asymmetric power, leaving things like domination, generally like oppression um, for these other kinds of abuse. But I do wonder about the discrimination between abled and disabled that you're working into the non-servitude proviso. It seems unjustified yeah. to me. Yeah, thanks. That's an important point. Uh, and I explicitly intended this, uh, the able bodied and minded idea to cover cases where uh, someone can, so an able bodied and minded agent is someone who can use external means to perform an intentional action. And that's important to me because I think that exploitation is a kind of servitude and servitude requires the ability to perform intentional actions. So it requires the ability it requires that I be able to serve you in order for you to be able to exploit me. If I can't serve you, then you can't exploit me. That's the thought. And so if I can't perform intentional actions, then I'm not exploitable. So um, the, the thought is precisely what you said, that someone who is incapable of performing intentional actions is not exploitable. She might be oppressible, dominate, she might be capable of being dominated and she might be capable of being harmed um, and her extreme vulnerability, because that's what we're, we're talking about here, makes her uh, prominently liable to being um, abused and, 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 and harmed by other people. But I don't think she's exploitable um, because because exploitation is a kind of servitude. It is to serve others as their servant. And you can't serve others as their servant if, you're, if you can't perform intentional actions because you just can't serve them. Mm. Uh, did you want to follow up or you okay with that? Okay with that, yeah. It's kind of what I was thinking. And 
I guess it then just comes down to who were include how we're defining intentional action and who we're including within with it with having that capacity um which i think is broader than it's usually construed yeah yeah i mean that's relevant um but it's important that you know if you can't use an external means to um if you can't use an external means to uh affect an outcome an outcome in the external world, then, then you can't perform. Uh, and, and then you're not able-bodied in the sense that's, um, that's relevant to, to the account of exploitation I'm trying to defend in any case. Uh, sure, thank you. I want, to, I want to come back to it with a question of my own, but first I'll um, ask Aaron to give his uh, Question. This is related to this one. You can go first. No, no, don't. please. Oh, okay. Um, so <clears throat> it struck me that kind of the, the structure of this move was to make exploitation not so much um, something related to uh, kind of theft and kind of the these sorts of things, but make it about agency specifically um, and the way that capitalism impacts the agency of some as opposed to others. And so I was wondering what the relationship between exploitation on this view and other impacts capitalism is said to have on agency, according to Marx, like alienation and things of that sort. And kind of how, if, if this is how we're looking at exploitation, how does the critique of capitalism via exploitation relate to that via alienation or other sorts of things of that sort? Yeah, well, alienation is, is such a, um, it's such a slippery notion, as you know. Uh, it might refer to psychological pathologies, uh, but it might be a description of the conditions of labor. If it's a psychological malady or a psychological problem, then it's not. I'm not interested in it, and neither is Marx. I don't think. Marx is interested in alienation as a, you know, psychological property, um, and a lot of the stuff that's being written these days on meaningful work, blah blah. blah I, I don't think that, um, insofar as it requires a psychological or a psychologized notion of alienation, I don't think it's it's very relevant or interesting. But alienation as a as a condition of labor, so alienation as uh, my, uh, as a condition in which my uh, agency must be under the unilateral control of another, uh, of course is relevant. And in fact, this is what I think, this is what capital is. Capital is, just is uh, uh, a title, a monetary title, to unilateral control over alien labor. So alienation in that sense is part of the definition of um, capital as a form of exploitation. So uh, capital is, is kind of pecuniary title to unilaterally control the labor of others. And that's, I think, a structural feature. It's built into the nature of, of capitalist relations. And then a capitalist is anyone who owns that title, anyone who owns that title, that monetary claim to unilateral control of the labor of others is a, is a, is a capitalist. So yeah, alienation has a central role to play in this debate, but because it's such a slippery notion and because it gets thrown around so much by people who, you know, um, don't have, you know, they, they don't define the concept, um, uh, you know, we need to say more about it and theorize it more um, uh, by rethinking, by thinking both its its economics and its uh, its philosophy. I suppose that's part of what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so that's uh, yeah. You even use the term alien in your description of the uh, control over the conditions of others. So I wanted to uh, focus on the positive account, which is extremely close to my own in many ways. Um, 
And so, but I, I had developed it more generally. So just in terms of your own, like the book title, are you essentially saying that exploitation is one form of domination and there are other forms of domination that seem to be what you were saying with respect to Patricia? Um, my own account in, you know, which grows out of the Marxist social ontology. So where I think you, you do find a lot of support and I mean, that I think your view is Marx's view, especially uh, in Grundrisse, where he talks about uh, control over the labor of others explicitly and sees alienation as a process in which, uh, which partly results from the activity of the workers reproducing capital in that way. Uh, but to my own view actually has two roots. One is from Marx and the other is also from feminism and the critique of domination. So my account of domination um, in rethinking democracy and elsewhere and growing out of the feminist critique as well as the Marxist critique is that it involves control over the conditions of agency of others. So I put emphasis on conditions and then uh, as opposed to direct control over the agency of others. Uh, because I would, I, I think that that is more responsive to a, a form, which I think Marx also believed of like a direct coercion, uh, which he regarded as characteristic of slavery rather than of capitalism. So one just question in terms of your own view is uh, whether you mean by servitude, something different from slavery. Um, you know, that it would seem to require some kind of distinction there. And whether, um, you know, why, well, just to, I guess, advocate for the need, this whole account seems to me to drive towards a more general account of domination and a more, with respect to what I take to be a conception of positive freedom as self-development of individuals over time. But the important, the reason that one needs that is that there are elements of the normative view that seem to me to arise direct, directly from the idea of uh, control or restrictions on the self-determination of individuals on their bare agency, on their intentionality, on their capacity um, to, have purposes at all. And there are some elements that are, are better character and that that's a very strong claim. And there are some elements that involve control over conditions of agency, uh, the necessary conditions that people have in order to pursue their purposes. And I think you're sort of, there's an ambiguity in the, at least the presentation today between those two views. Um, it, it's control over the agency by means of control over the conditions is, is the most standard forms of domination, including exploitation in my own view, as opposed to directly like shackling a person where, uh, but even there, I mean, there's still some agency involved. So I was just wondering how you, you know, I, I don't, I think one should be clearer as to whether it's conditions or in some direct servitude, uh, sl enslavement notion. Well, yeah, you're right that, um, so it, it's not, so servitude and slavery, of course, I, I don't think they are, I mean, slavery is one form of servitude, but the, uh, the claim of the paper and the claim I want to defend is that um, servitude is a, a generic term that entails domination and, uh, and it is, it, it is, endemic to uh, serfdom, slavery, but also capitalism. Um, and uh, the claim I want to make, I suppose, is that, um, of course, under capitalism, what you get is control over agency through control over its conditions, namely control over uh, the means that humans need in order to produce their lives, uh, as opposed to directly um, controlling their, um, their, um, um, their intentionality and their, well, their agency. But the operative distinction here, I suppose, is the Kantian one between um, uh, the existence of 
purposes versus the existence of purposiveness. And I think it is relevant that both the capitalist and the feudal lord don't uh, just uh, subsume purposes um, or undermine or encroach upon purposes. They subsume purposiveness. They uh, undermine my ability to uh, 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 set and pursue productive ends independently. Um, and so, um, so yeah, agency, I think, is, too, is probably too, um, it's probably too generic a concept here to allow us to make that discrimination. Because I do want to say that certain forms of alteration of the conditions of your agency in the sense of, you know, I buy this piece of land, you buy that, I prevent you from entering that, but do I interfere with your purposiveness? No. Um, it has to be, there has to be a way to draw this distinction. And the way I try to do it is through, you know, um, unilateral, through, but by emphasizing this, this servitude idea, so unilateral control over my ability to set the end of standing standing there or occupying this space or um, uh, making this this making the um, um, this space my means making the 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 eggs the means to my omelet and so on um, so and and so this for is I time, for for a period of time per day right yes but we're talking so we're talking an aspect of my purposiveness here right? so we're not talking purposiveness as a whole we're talking um i think we're talking my productive purposiveness in the sense of my ability to uh, produce um certain ends um uh, certain, well, I mean, what, what production means here and how productive purpose, purposiveness is to be spelled out is important. Uh, but I take it to refer to, you know, things that I need in order, th things that I need to produce in order to survive and the sets of, the set of means that I need to uh, set um, in order to, uh, to will the ends that I must mean, that I must uh, will in order to survive. Okay, thank you. Uh, we could go on, but I will call on some others. Um, let me see who was first. I'm not sure. I think it was Roz. Roz Balo. Yes, thank you. I uh, thank you, and I want to uh, thank the speaker. Thank you so much for um, raising this whole issue. I thought I, I was very excited when I saw. Uh, the, the topic. Um, but I would like to kind of switch or, or suggest um, another way of thinking about um, the issue. Because what I had thought when I first saw the, you know, the subject matter, that this was going to do something that I had been addressing or thinking about for many, many, for a long time. And that is instead of redistribution, a focus on production. And instead of focusing on oppression or domination or, or a focus on um, well, hold off on the oppression and, and domination bit for a bit, but instead a focus on, uh, people use the word development, and I, to me, what's really important is the notion of ongoing development, the dynamism or uh, of a system, its logic, and the 
um, the evolution, the uh, constant continual evolving of society, uh, which involves production. And it involves things like um, uh, coming up with new concepts of what a resource is, right? Um, so, uh, you know, if we exploit all of our uh, natural resources in a way that's, that's detrimental to the future, the em emphasis is on always thinking ahead and involved in research and development so that there, uh, it would be thinking about production uh, in terms of um, ongoing human development and ongoing social development through ongoing research and development. So instead, so, so I mean, it seems to me that that is missing in what's being discussed. And I, I always like the term that Marx used of fettering um, uh, when he talks in the Communist Manifesto of, you know, revolution occurs when the uh, forces of production are, are fettered that we could produce more, but it's being held back. We could have greater prosperity, but instead we have a, an economic depression. Uh, and in uh, his later works where he talks about the need that, you know, under socialism, of course, to also have um, uh, ongoing investment in research and development, the whole idea of relative surplus value that you need to keep, uh, uh, reinvesting and thinking about how to improve production and productivity, et cetera. And then in terms of social life, there's more of a sense of, you know, we're all contributing to the good of the whole, to the ongoing development of the whole. Now, how, you, uh, how we then deal with the issue of uh, decision-making, maybe it has to be a kind of an accountability of applying reason so I guess maybe instead of uh, saying the word production, I would use the word reason, applying reason to the ongoing evolution of society, making us self-consciously involved in moving society uh, and to do that through the use of reason. And, uh, you know, maybe some kind of accountability where one says, this is where I think we should be going. And another one says, I think we should be doing this and here's why. Uh, which is a little different from the notion of kind of like minimizing labor uh, so people can be free to do what they want. It's more of a notion of looking at the larger picture of social evolving or evolution. Okay, thank you. So Nick, what do you want to say to that? Well, the notion of fettering is relevant and important, as you know, in um... Marx's work, and I think, I hope uh, that someone will pick it up and develop a, a social theory out of it. But, um, you know, it, it's also a very vague and, um, and slippery concept. The way Marx uses it in the Communist Manifesto is to talk about how, you know, um, the bourgeois modes of mode of production, how capitalism effectively uh, creates its own grave diggers because it um, it fetters, it constrains the, the development of the productive forces and at the same time, the development of uh, um, human, human productive power and so on. But there are other interpretations of fettering that are operative and relevant here, which, have, which relate to the, you know, the alienation idea that was mentioned before, which is that, you know, uh, a kind of constraint on human productive th that that uh, uh, um, fettering could just be the set of constraints that capitalism sets not on the development of the human of human productive power as a whole, but rather on the development of um, human productive power as a whole subject to uh, the free development of the individual. So there's no doubt that capitalism vastly develops human productive power, vastly develops 
uh, uh, research and and vastly develops human beings. I mean, there's no question that capitalism does that. Uh, but that free development of all does not come together with the free development of each. And the Communist Manifesto also says that you know, in socialist society, the the free development of all will and must come and must be subject to the free development of each. But then the question is, what is this free development of each and how do you get it in conjunction with the free development of all? And it turns out that combining these two notions is much more difficult than Marx thought. I think it's impossible. <laughs> if we want the kind of prodigious productivity that capitalism gives us, then we have to give up on the idea of the free development of each. And if we want to keep the free development of each, then we have to give up the idea of the prodigious uh, growth and development that capitalism provides. Uh, unlike Marx, I don't think we have any reason to be as optimistic as he was about the possibility of socialism succeeding capitalism uh, and it growing in the womb of the old society and so on. So all this fettering business, I think, arises in the context of a, of a, uh, a technological determinism that Marx came later in his life to demure from. And it also show, and, it, and I think it's also Pretty, pretty prevalent in his later writings that there are going to be trade-offs, trade-offs that uh, these ideas, which he espoused in his earlier work, uh, just dismissed because of this over-optimism about the, the development of the, of the species and the possibilities for emancipation that will create. It turns out that these possibilities do not necessarily lead to the free development of each. And that's, I think, one reason to rethink both the free development of all, but especially and more importantly, I think the free development of each and how we might achieve that by moving beyond the institutions of um, capitalism. <clears throat> well, that was interesting. Okay, Zechra. <laughs> uh, thank you. This is quite interesting, uh, the presentation. I also enjoy the questions posed. So in a certain way, my question uh, or certain things I want to stress will be follow up. So my, one is that it is uh, you uh, kind of uh, been dismissive of alienation, uh, saying that it's a slippery uh, concept, but isn't that uh, critical to the uh, emancipation, especially in that uh, uh, your own uh, reference, the uh, non-servitude uh, proviso. And uh, in addition to the strange labor and the species being that Marx em emphasizes there, I would like to point out that his um, uh, positive uh, view of automation, I recently wrote a paper on automation, so I, I am more thinking in those uh, terms, the, uh, the use of machinery, which Mark re refers as the dead labor, uh, is a repressive in uh, instrument uh, in capitalism, but it is critical for the actually emancipation of the uh, worker in, the, in socialism, in social stage and relies upon that. So that is that gives me the notion that Marx actually doesn't focus only on uh, servitude uh, in the sense that one is giving, providing labor uh, to somebody else, but uh, it is uh, also in, there is an understanding that subsistence, our needs no matter what mode of production we are in, requires some burdensome labor in addition to rewarding. And the automation he sees as a, in, the, in my reading, a way of kind of reducing that burdensome 
uh, labor. So that's one thing I wanted to uh, just throw in and see what you see, think about it. And then I would like to go to Carol's point, uh, which I um, think she was not quite satisfied with your answer. And I want to put it in a few different, uh, in a different uh, way, um, both kind of bringing in Marxism and feminism. Uh, the two, two concepts, one we can say, think about it as internalization of uh, domination. That is the, uh, this is uh, addressed a lot in feminist literature. Or Marxist, if we go by a more, much more Marxist references, false consciousness. And so if you think about these in terms of uh, uh, hindering uh, or uh, restricting agency, uh, how would you kind of uh, reformulate or revisit your uh, non-servitude proviso? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um... So yeah, you're right. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the first point, I think you're right that um, reducing toil is is at the is at the center of of Marx's vision of the free society, and I think it, it should be. It's right. It's right that it's there, and I think it's a necessary reducing toil and reducing the amount of time we work is a necessary condition for us to be able to govern ourselves and our lives. If you know we have to work eight hours a week uh, teaching, for example, then we can't join. Uh, committees uh, that govern the university and then managers govern the university and then uh, we're dominated. <laughs> um, and this is, I think this is, a, this is a general phenomenon. If you don't reduce the amount of time that people have to work, then you're gonna get managers managing their labor and therefore you're gonna get uh, domination and servitude and all that, all that business. So I think that's certainly a part of the, the theory. Uh, but of course, again, uh, free time or uh, time uh, managing your own activities as opposed to performing these activities. All, all of these questions presuppose uh, that we have a relatively clear notion of the conditions under which we have to produce uh, uh, independently. So under what conditions can I produce independently from you? Where that does not mean that I go out in the in the forest and do my own thing. We have to do this together, but we have to do this in a non-subjective way. And the notion of alienation won't get us very far in thinking about what this means exactly. The notion of alienation might be part of a story, but it can't, uh, it won't and can't be the whole story. Um, and, you know, uh, Marx, you're right that um, he envisages that uh, machinery, and, um, and mechanization are gonna improve uh, our ability to release ourselves from soil, although under capitalism, this, this relationship of priority is, is reversed. Uh, but again, I think Marx was over optimistic about the possibilities of productive growth under capitalism uh, and that he overestimated both the ability of the planet to uh, withstand the development of uh, productive power, but also the extent to which this productive power would release us from, um, from necessary toil. He doesn't evince this, uh, this over-optimism in volume three of Capital, as you know, where he talks about the realm of uh, freedom uh, being based on the realm of necessity and so on. But he does evince it in many other of his writings, including his, certainly including his um, early writings, the German ideology and all the stuff that came after it until he started thinking about political economy in the 1850s. Um, in respect of the uh, uh, false consciousness idea and the internalization idea, I think that's relevant to what I'm trying to do here. But unlike many self-professed Marxists maybe, I don't think Marx is interested in, um, in false consciousness. And when he discusses, so for example, the uh, whole business of fetishism and the fetishism of commodities, 
I don't think that's an, uh, that's, uh, that's about internalization of oppressive norms um, or about uh, false consciousness. Um, I think Marx has in mind something completely different there, which is uh, uh, about uh, objective illusions, where the objective illusion is simply the uh, uh, the um, the notion which is prevalent and true that you know. Um, uh, uh, the worker and the capitalist are both property owners. The capitalist owns capital and the worker owns her own labor power. Uh, and these, these are facts. These are facts about the capitalist world. Um, but they also conceal uh, a content, uh, a substance. And that substance is the oppression of the, the worker by the capitalists. But again, in order to make sense of that notion, we need uh, a normative yardstick. And this is what the, the non-servitude proviso and related notions, uh, Carroll's own conception of, um, of subjection of agency and the conditions of agency and so on. These are all relevant yardsticks that we can use in uh, understanding what's going on there and how to how to think about the critique of institutions without appealing to notions like uh, false consciousness and so on. That doesn't mean these notions are irrelevant. I think they're relevant and very important, but they're not um, internal to the whole Marx Marxian theoretical machinery, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that Marx didn't reflect on that, but I'm just wondering, um, just to push to get a little bit clearer on your view, you framing it in terms of being engaged in some kind of collective activity. Do you think that your account of, of domination is restricted to that? Because that, that was the sense in which I was bringing in the feminist account in that it, the original notions of sort of male domination or individual on individual domination. Is that something different from not to say that that's the whole feminist account by any means. And of course there's structural elements there too. But uh, is that required for your account A of domination and B of exploitation that, there, that it be within the context of some kind of uh, joint or shared endeavor? Uh, and then how is that described? Is that gonna be constituted by any, sh is it gonna be institutional? Is it gonna be constituted by shared goals? How are you understanding that condition under which you are seeing exploitation emerge? Yeah, these are good questions. I, I don't have a, a complete answer to them, partly because this paper is reactive to Rome, or partly because uh, a complete answer to this question would require a theory of the state. Um, and I, I don't have that. Um, and, and uh, but of course, the, the relevant notion of purposiveness here is productive purposiveness in mandatory social cooperation with others, where mandatory just means geared towards our mutual uh, conditions of independence. So I take it that there are independent reasons for people to uh, cooperate with each other and to do things that, um, and to serve each other. So I take it that there are independent reasons for people to, uh, you know, make kebabs and uh, ice creams and write papers and uh, dance and whatever. Right. There are independent reasons to do that, and so, so and, and these reasons could these reasons could be conclusive and mandatory. So there could be a Kantian move here to the effect that uh, not only are we. Uh, uh, are we social animals, but we're also political animals in the, not just in the Aristotelian sense, but even the stronger sense that we are, we can rightfully coerce each other to enter into a condition in which we uh, uh, serve one another's conditions of purposiveness. That's the Kantian move. Uh, so there's certainly, uh, a thought lurking there in the background about how we do this together. But I don't have a, a theory about how or an account about how this togetherness might be subverted 
by the nature of the institutions themselves. What I'm trying to throw out here is the a, a yardstick for their normative assessment. And I have some views about their social constitution, but that's probably a topic for another, okay. <laughs> another seminar. Okay, I just wanted to point out, to highlight that I think there are issues there and whether it extends to something like families that, yeah. you know, and so forth. <clears throat> I think it's a general notion, domination, but not necessarily exploitation. Yeah. But anyway, Aaron. I agree. Yeah, I agree. So, and, and I think, I, I agree. And I think a lot of what we've discussed certainly applies to, to families and patriarchies and so on, uh, uh, which, of course, insofar as they feature, you know, unilateral control over, over the labor of others. But the primary target here, I suppose, is um, the structural features of an uh, of certain proprietarian arrangements in economic equilibrium. So where there's uh, millions of people interacting, and there's a uh, and we need to uh, not just help each other serve one another in the right way, in an, in an independent way, but we need to do it uh, under conditions of scarcity and requirements of reproduction. So we need to reproduce what we have. We need to reproduce all the, the, the kebabs and or our ability to make all the kebabs and all the, the papers and all the screens and all the, and all the cars. And we need to do it in a, in a way that we serve one another's freedom. Okay, I think that's great, especially for exploitation. Anyway, Callum. Uh, th thanks very much for the for the talk. Um, I had a kind of, sorry, can people hear me? Okay. I just, I just uh, Aaron, did I pass over you or? Um, I had a question, but it kind of indirectly got answered through answering yours, so I'm fine. Okay, yeah. uh, Callum, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, oh, not at all. Um, yeah, I, I've got a sort of rough. Uh, not not well thought through, so apologies in advance. Um, question about the, the sort of broad framing that you gave for, the, for this talk in terms of reclaiming independence and just trying to get a sense of it in to what extent or in what respects we should reclaim independence and to what extent and in what respects you think that we should in so doing sort of jettison what people might have thought of as a sort of leftist commitment to the value of dependence or something like that. So I take it that there's some rough line in socialist, in, in socialist and Marxist thought, which holds that it's sort of part of capitalism and part of a capitalist social ethos that there's something good and valuable about independence, where that is something like standing on your own two feet and not depending upon other people to provide things for you, but to get it yourself. And that's important for self-respect and all these other sorts of things. And the capitalists and the defenders thereof take it that the sort of social provision for other people's needs that socialists tend to like is one of the bad things about that is that it undermines that standing in your own two feet or that sort of independence. And therefore, I, I take it that there's this strain in socialist thought that says, look, we should reject that and start celebrating our, our dependence upon one another and saying, look, depending on one another can be a, a wonderful thing. It can be sort of an expression of our social nature or it can be a reflection of our community and our solidarity uh, or something along those lines. Um, and that's all a, a very sort of rough <laughs> idea, but I, I think it's part of people's rough sort of understanding of the left and the right on dependence and independence. And I'm just wondering whether what you've, you take this, this response to Roma to be doing, whether we should see that as giving us a reason to actually distance ourselves as socialists, Marxists or leftists from celebrating dependence, or whether you just think, look, we can say look, there's some good things about independence and that's this purposiveness stuff. There's also some good stuff about dependence to do with community and solidarity, and that's all good. And we, we can have these things at the same time or, or might they sort of come into tension? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's the latter. Uh, I think that, so the, yeah, so this is very important, but I think, yeah, it's, um, uh, so there's two things that are, I think are relevant here. One is to certainly, I think that, um, of course we should take um, 
uh, we should celebrate certain forms of dependence, you know, my dependence on my friends, my dependence on my, uh, my, my wife and so on. Um, these are things to, that I have at least pro tanto reason to, to celebrate. And we should also celebrate my independent, you know, our independence of each, of, of one another uh, in the sense that we can't by right, um, by right, um, get one another to, to, to do things unilaterally um, if and when th that's the case. So, I, but that's a, but that's a superficial response on my part. The more interesting question is, uh, and I take it that this is the question that Marx wants to ask, and he does ask in the Grundrisse, uh, especially, is you know that you have this system, which is market um, capitalist market society, in which uh, everyone is dependent on everyone else for nearly everything they do, for everything you know, the, the pen and the screen and the and the uh, and and the table. Uh, which arises and depends upon uh, a semblance of complete independence. You know, there, there's a, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'm dependent on you. I don't think I'm dependent on my boss. All I do is I go out and sell her my, my labor power. I'm a commodity, an independent commodity owner, owner. I'm not unilaterally answerable to her. So there's a kind of unmasking that we can do if we have a sufficiently discriminating account of dependence and independence. And I take it that this is what Marx is trying to do. I, I think the critique of political economy is precisely this task of unmasking this semblance of independence as a kind of uh, uh, domination, the semblance of independence that the, the, that commercial society creates to the effect that I'm independent of you just because I'm a commodity owner, I own this thing and I can sell it to you. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that, that you won't, uh, that, that I'm not subject to you uh, unilaterally and that you won't subsume my, my purposiveness. It's just that you're gonna subsume it, not in the way the serf and the, the the you're going to subsume it not in the way the feudal lord and the sir and the and the patriarch and the and the slave owner did it you're going to do it by means of things you're going to be do it by means of uh, money your ownership or money uh, your ownership and control over uh, uh you know monetary um uh, claims to to, to unilateral control over 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 me, uh, so yeah, uh, all of this is about I suppose dependence and independence and how to think about it. And I think uh, there's an important if we're sufficiently discriminating and clear about the relevant notions of dependence and independence here, we can do some unmasking of these ideological notions of independence that you mentioned and that are pervasive in um, in commercial societies yeah uh, I have, I have a, yeah uh, just yeah so the the one thing that i'm ha still have a kind of vague lingering worry that what you're saying is is cutting against that broad sort of socialist celebration of of dependence that i was trying to push before is that part of your response sounded a bit like you're saying you know, I depend on my wife, I depend on my friends, you know, and that's good. But when I go out into the workplace, when I go out into the sort of the public sphere, then it's appropriate for, for our relations to, to be characterized by something more like independence and not the same sort of um, dependence that it's sort of good and appropriate to see in the private sphere. And I take it that there's this one line that comes up in, in, in early Marx in the comment on James Mill and in, in on the Jewish question, which is trying to push against that, that, that sort of division. And it comes through in other socialist work where the idea is, no, we should have something more like the fraternal communal um, uh, solidaristic relations, um, even, even in the sort of public political sphere. And it's appropriate and good for, 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 for that to occur in a way that, that, that can't be 
uh, accounted for by standard sort of liberal values or, or, or that isn't properly respected by capitalist institutions or something like that. Um, and if that's the, I mean, maybe it is the case that we should jettison, jettison that sort of vague line. Um, and maybe it's the case that, that you are pushing against it, but I'm just, is, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Well, there, are two yeah. Forms, there are two forms of interdependence. I prefer that term than to dependence, but one is, I mean, you certainly don't want people to depend on pain of not having means of subsistence or something like that, you know, under threat. Uh, and there is an element of, of uh, voluntariness and, and freedom that can be introduced into forms of interdependence. So I think it's kind of a mistake to think of those in their proper interpretation as opposites. Hopefully not, because the people are fundamentally social beings in a certain way. But you, you don't want them to lose their, in, in, their freedom as a condition for being interdependent. You want them to. It, you want it to enhance their freedom. You want there to be a multiplicity of relationships, and uh, that isn't possible now. And all kinds of other ways of framing it that are uh, which, which would regard interdependence as consistent with the freedom, equal freedom of individuals. As, and it isn't now. It's under constraint for for a large numbers of people. I don't know, but I think that that would be a challenge to work that out. Well, but the, so isn't Cal, I think Callum is saying that this is um, that, that yeah I, I think you're agreeing right he, he say, he's saying that this is I don't know if it depends or interdependence there of a notion here I think it's a notion of community maybe that you have in mind Callum no this is uh, well, yeah, I think, I think the, also he the, wants to rejuvenate solidarity. <laughs> the the thought is that reflecting on the value of community or solidarity gives us a reason to celebrate our dependence upon one another, in the public sphere as well as the private sphere, or, or something like that. So, it's connected to dependence in the sense that we should reject the line that says it's good to stand on your own two feet and be independent of one another because of the value of communal relations or solidaristic relations or something like that. Yeah, I, I, again, yeah, I suppose it depends on, yeah, what the, what the relevant notion of community here. So I, I, I see, I, I, I think I understand your question better now. Um, and of course, I mean, even in the case of, uh, yeah, like friends and friendly relations, of course, you know, uh, even in these kinds of cases, uh, I think there's ways, to, you know, there's good, <laughs> there's good friendships and bad friendships. Um, and the, um, in the sense that you can, um, there can be dominating friendships, blah, blah, blah. So it, um, a, a kind of friendship that would celebrate, you know, the kind of friendship that would celebrate dependence. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure that would be that would be the you know that would be that would be friendship proper you know um, where I celebrate your dependence. So I I don't know. Um, uh, but again, yeah, the, the the relevant notion of community I think that's operative here is is relevant and whether that's capacious enough to exclude servitude. I take it that genuine friends. Um, can't be servants to one another. Right. Either okay. you're someone's servant or you're someone's friend. Um, so such that friendship entails uh, a form of non-servitude. Uh, but, you know, again, I, I, I don't know whether the concept of community and concepts of community and dependence are, are, are a bit slippery. So we, we know we, we need, well, we need to philosophize more about them, I suppose. Uh, you have a leading theorist of solidarity here in Canada. Yeah, I know, I know. A, I mean, a theorist of community to some degree, despite yeah. his individualism, or in, and because of his individualism. Okay, Aaron, last question, yeah. I think. Okay, um, so I think it's a small question, but it's related to this debate, and it's just about how, how we're supposed to understand purposiveness throughout kind of these various pictures that we're being given. And I think it, it, it relates to Colm's question in the following way, because part of, part of what confused me in terms of your account of non-servitude is um, 
Are we supposed to think of the purpose? To, purpose eh, I have struggled with this word. Are we supposed to think of agency at being expressed freely the same way under capitalism and kind of what we're striving for later? Um, because it seems like the, the notion, there's a presumption that the notion of agency that, for example, is in Nozick's condition, which is a very individualistic conception of agency, where it's one person expressing very explicitly their own intentions through their action or something like this. And the notion of agency that arises in collective action for the individual might not of commonality between those, or if we're thinking of agency itself as transitioning through this, like the, how we think of agency and how we think of the capacity to express one's agency uh, similarly across all of these different kinds of cases. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't have a theory of agency that is interesting. I, I mean, I alluded to the, you know, the ability to use external means to, to perform intentional actions. That's the operative notion of agency here. And it might be that in some cases, this requires shared, uh, shared agency or um, uh, joint actions and so on. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't want the account of subsumption of, of agency that I provide to be dependent on idiosyncratic assumptions about its constitution. You know, I want it to be as generic as possible because I want it to speak to anyone who has a view about agency. And I think ideally it, let, it, it should speak to uh, Nozickian, uh, Nozickian theories of, of agency because then, because then they have to be on board because then even Nozick has to be an anti-capitalist. Of course that won't happen, um, but uh, you see, uh, so, and of course, whether, so one question is the constitution of the kind of agency that can be subsumed and what it is to make you a servant. And another question is what would it take for this to, uh, what would it take for us to uh, put an end to this? And what means do we need to set in order to emancipate ourselves? And, I want to leave it open that a new or, a, or well, not a new, but a, a richer form of agency would be required to achieve that. That's possible, um, but I don't want to commit to any such notion. Um, yeah. And I don't think a revolution <laughs> presupposes uh, the, 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 the constitution of revolutionary agency, for example, presupposes any such prosaic notion. But that's something to, have to read his dissertation, about. which is on that topic. I uh, see. So you have all kinds of uh, relevant you know, issues that people here are concerned with. So thank you very much, Nick, for this exceptionally interesting talk. People have had to leave. They're all saying how much in the chat, they're saying how much they enjoyed it. So. Uh, it was really great for us. It was terrific hosting you. And we'll look forward to your coming to visit us in person sometime. In yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Thank you all very much for your comments. Thank you, Carol, for uh, the invitation. It was, it was great. And I look forward to the next time uh, very soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks again, everybody.